My name is Annelie Kamoy and I'm the Chair of the Dublin Law and Politics Review. And it's my great pleasure to be announcing today's panel on mental health and lockdown policies. We know the devastating effects of the coronavirus upon the human body. And in response, many governments have introduced lockdown measures. But these policies were intended to be short. But as corona progresses, we notice that they have become longer and more frequent. Now the question is, what effect do these lockdown measures have upon our mental health? Depression is three time, has been three times more relevant and actually has physical effects such as proneness to heart attack, a decreased immune system. So at what point do these effects outweigh the benefits of a lockdown policy? That is what tonight's panel will evaluate and it's my great pleasure to say, see so many interesting speakers from the field of po ethics, psychology, law and politics. So without further ado, I'd very much like to hand the floor to Brenda Daly, who will be our chair for today. She is an as associate professor in healthcare law at the DCU School of Law and Government. Brenda, thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Annalika, and I'd like to welcome all of our speakers tonight. I would just like to welcome our first speaker, who is Ashleen Doherty. Um, so Ashleen is going to, is joining us. She's uh, health, mental Health Promotion Manager uh, with Mental Health Ireland. Um, so part of her responsibilities are overseeing the development and delivery of evidence-based mental health and wellbeing programs and initiatives. Um, so Ashleen has to leave us after her presentation. So there will be questions immediately after Ashleen's uh, presentation uh, on what she has just discussed. So I'd like to hand the floor over to Ashleen. So it's all yours. Um, welcome everyone and thanks for coming along this evening, a very cold evening for us all, so I'm sure the kettle is on. Um, so as, as Brenda mentioned, my, my name is Ashling Doherty, I'm the Mental Health Promotion Manager with Mental Health Ireland and I oversee the rollout kind of, of evidence-based programmes, initiatives, campaigns at Mental Health Ireland um, uh, that look at better supporting and promoting positive mental health. Um, and that can vary from different settings in schools, workplaces, uh, the home, in communities. Um, so pre, I thought pre-lockdown and pre-COVID, my job was hard, but uh, we have seen unprecedented demand for mental health and wellbeing related resources, campaigns, initiatives over the past few months. So I'm just going to dive in um, just a little bit about Mental Health Ireland. We're probably the longest established one of the longest established mental health charities in Ireland um, back in 1950, we were established in response to the National Inquiry into um, acute mental health services in Ireland and the unprecedented numbers. There was over 22,000 people in acute mental health services that was probably not warranted um, at the time and could receive um, care for their mental health needs within the community. So um, after the National Inquiry, um, Mental Health Ireland was set up um, around uh, community-based organisations across the country um, looking to support people who were coming back into their community with mental health needs um, uh, to re-establish, I suppose, housing um, and, and get back into work and employment and so on from there. Um, and our vision is, I suppose, a mental health, or sorry, an Ireland with, um, I suppose, our, our mission and our aim um, in our day-to-day -day is to promote positive mental health, well-being and recovery for all the people within Ireland. So I suppose as we reflect on 2020, um, then words like virus, lockdown, um, and, and how we, we go about our day to day from uh, today on the, what are we, the, the 7th of December, when we look back at the 17th of March, you know, life as we know it has been 
um, changed um, and, and it's, you know, how we, we go about our day to day things as such as, as work, our work and life, our holidays, our, um, how we exercise, how and when we contact our friends, how and when we contact our family, when we see these people, how we socialize everything. Um, as you can imagine, has changed. So within that, within change um, and, and change within our behaviours and our, um, I suppose, our, our day-to-day, it will bring with it, you know, none of us, um, you know, would would be told not to assume that this has had an impact on us and it will um, have an impact on us for a while to come. Um, and, 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 and that's why, I suppose, mainly around our mental health as well and our well-being. So looking at the figures to date, I suppose, what we know so far um, around that earlier intervention piece, we know that uh, following during lockdown, obviously GP visits were down um, and that was warranted with uh, frontline services. We were asked to, to not contact our GP if for, for them kind of other non-COVID related issues um, or to phone. We know that primary care visits in general, so your primary care would be your, your front of line, not just your GP, but also your practice nurse, your um, physiotherapist, your counselling um, loads of different kind of frontline services are placed within your primary care centres um, and all them visits were down. We also know the preventative services, they were closed during the first lockdown as well. So any kind of early cancer intervention preventative services were all closed down. Um, we know um, a lot of the day services for people with um, acute mental health needs were closed as well. So again, all this stuff was, was, was off limits really for people. So again, having a huge impact and a knock on effect. When we look at some of the stats, um, we found that um, there has been a 20% increase in anxiety, 23% increase in depression, um, 18% increase in post-traumatic stress, and a 41% increase in loneliness. Um, and uh, some further research from the TILDA study as well recently, um, alongside in conjunction with a loan, um, found that there was an increase in suicidal ideation in our older adults. Um, so again, some alarmist statistics within that, but again, coming from a fact that we were actually locked into where we, you know, our place of um, where we lived and within our own communities for such a long time that uh, it, it can have that impact. Uh, some of the behavioural trends that we noticed, uh, just some of the ones that we, we, we pull out from there, alcohol went up, tobacco con consumption went up and our uh, reliance on junk food and sweets went up as well. And this came from our CSO survey back in April. Um, and there would probably be three of the, the negative ways of coping or the negative most uh, impactful on, on our health and well-being um, lifestyle choices within that as well. Uh, some research recently from mental health reform um, showed us that some of those groups that might be more particularly um, experienced particular mental health challenges brought on by the crisis were those who may have lost or are at risk of losing their jobs. Again, financial security um, was a huge impact on, on have, has huge uh, lasting impacts as well on our mental health and well-being. Individuals who maybe have been separated from loved ones, so there was a lot of people across the country who couldn't visit their loved ones. Um, healthcare workers and our first-line responders, again, a huge amount of work has been put back into supporting the mental health and well-being of our healthcare workers and first uh, responders. Children and young people who are being kept out of school for some of those young people um, you know, school was a safe haven. Maybe they weren't coming from, um, you know, home life that was as safe. So um, again, for them, it was a very protective factor for their mental health. Women who were at a heightened risk of domestic abuse, the elderly and people with pre-existing mental health difficulties. And then looking again at our younger people, Bernardo found that young people um, are feeling the effects on their mental health too. Over half missed their friends, 53% struggled with the bedtime routine and 38% experienced more tantrums and outbursts. Um, and again, I, I don't know, you know, we, we said the head in there, those that experience more will brought on by the lockdown, but there's not many not mentioned there, you know? So it has affected us all um, in different ways and different means. And just some recent research from the United Nations uh, found that even after the pandemic is brought under control, grief, anxiety, depression will still be prevalent. And that's to go with any type of um, 
I, I suppose, issue that has gone on this length, we can't expect it to, I suppose, disappear overnight as well. So we will have to address those issues following. Um, another issue just I wanted to, I suppose, touch on for a minute as well was the fact that our lives have changed so much around work and, and where our work is and, and that we're, we're finding that's having a huge impact on people's mental health. I suppose in the beginning, it was great. We, we had a new sense of freedom, a new uh, flexibility. We had more time at home. We had more time to spend with our families. We had more time to exercise. We had more um, less commuting time. We didn't have a dress code. You know, there was a lot of positives to it. But with that, um, has we've seen a huge amount of negatives. We, you know, I think people are starting to feel the, um, I suppose, the, the harsh reality of having more time with family, having more time with the kids, having more time, um, you know, at home. The blurred lines between the work-life balance comes in um, when we can switch off, when we can't. Um, and, and that comes with itself that, the, the, you know, an increase in the level of burnout among our staff um, across Ireland. And we're seeing an increase in the number of um, organisations seeking that kind of better support for their employees' mental health and well-being, which is a fantastic um, initiative that uh, I suppose people are, are reaching out a bit more, but it's something just to be mindful of, I suppose, around um, working from home, its effect um, not only on our, our mental health and well-being, but like taking sick days when you need sick days, um, taking your annual leave when you need it and not just putting it off because, you know, we're in a lockdown. You do need that time away from technology to to detach as well. Some of the positives, uh, we've gone through a lot of the, I suppose, the negative impacts or the, how our lives have changed, but there has been some positives um, that we found in the literature and the research. Um, you know, the community spirit that came about after the lockdown, or especially lockdown one, was phenomenal. You know, people reaching out, uh, volunteer within their communities, getting behind different initiatives to support their neighbours, people who were cocooning at the time. Our adoptions to digital technologies was phenomenal as well. We've seen a huge change in how we um, access mental health services as well um, and get support from our frontline GP services. Um, but again, just being mindful of the digital divide within that, we'll see a lot of people who have, um, we, we see the re from the research, older adults don't have access to digital technologies or um, as much as ourselves. But, um, you know, again, just being mindful that not everything can go through um, a digital platform um, and we can't re, uh, I suppose, uh, change or, or, or put forward digital instead over that face to face connection. Um, Sorry, Louis or Ashley, you have uh, two minutes left. Two minutes. Brilliant. Yep. Yeah. Our exercise habits. We've seen a huge surge in um, our, our um, walking habits and um, an increase in, in those exercise and Zoom hit classes and so on. Getting out into nature was a huge one. Um, seeing our new parks, woodlands, um, different uh, venues for walking. So again, stuff to keep a hold of going forward. Our contribution to the community, again, uh, more than just, I suppose, a nod at the neighbour, we got to know the neighbour, we got to say hello to the neighbour. So again, another positive to take forward. And obviously, some of the impacts that we've had on climate action change as well, um, which will probably come forward into the new year um, in, in the news. We'll see, I suppose, as, as COVID might start to move on, uh, we might see more chat around that and the benefits of it. So. Our response as a nation, like other countries, we went online, we went to telemedicine and e-communications. Um, and then we also found that the United Nations have a three-tiered uh, response plan for um, mental health issues. And that's a whole of society approach, um, widespread availability of emergency mental health and psychosocial support and support recovery from COVID-19 by building mental health services for the future. So again, some of the recommendations going forward. We adapted ourselves in Mental Health Ireland. We put all our resources online. We adapted through different ways um, to, to use, I suppose, our general campaigns that would um, we, we promote on a normal day to day. We adapted all the language for um, life within COVID, so our five ways for tough times and so on. So you'll get a, a load of different resources um, on our website there. But again, something we had to do to, to speak to the audiences that were looking for support. We've seen a massive surge in online supports, um, looking for resources, people 
were, um, I suppose, just begging out and, and looking for more information on how better to support their own mental health needs. We've seen it phenomenally um, over, over the last eight months. And then finally, our, our, our own HSE and Department of Health have uh, their own responses as well under yourmentalhealth.ie. Um, and you'll hear on the radio and we received a booklet, the Keep Well campaign. So again, a huge emphasis on the fact that we need to keep well this winter and look after our mental health and well-being. Um, so thank you very much. Um, really interesting overview in terms of the work uh, that's been carried out by Mental Health Ireland. Um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm moderating the, effect, or the event and have a question just in respect of the, um, you mentioned actually in the UN response plan and that they're trying to promote that widespread, avail widespread availability of mental health resources. And I just, that obviously comes with financial consequences as well. So has the government invested um, to any real degree in supporting you know the kind of the initiative of the UN response plan and the work that you're trying to do as well mental health Ireland yeah and they have I, I suppose to a certain extent they have in June we uh, the department launched the new mental health policy um, so uh, sharing the vision so it was, it, it was brought forward from the previous one and they have um, stated that they will be investing a huge amount in, in getting that policy up and running and, and implemented in terms of the response uh, the keep well campaign has been invested in um, somewhat but we will always find that the mental health that kind of mental health promotion stuff the um, early intervention stuff it's it's um, harder to invest in, I suppose, because it's not that frontline piece. In terms of the frontline pieces, um, we will see further investment, hopefully down the line. The impacts haven't been seen um, around the acute, the need for the acute cares just yet. As a nation, we've always needed to invest more in our mental health services. So I don't, I don't think that's has stopped. Um, uh, if Anthony, it's just exasperated that, that need. Um, a bit more for our nation but um, yeah we would hope that especially with the launch of our policy we'd be we'd be um, hoping that more would be coming forward from that um, in terms and, and an implementation group has been set up for that policy as well mm -hmm. yeah I, I think as a nation we over the past five years we've uh, five ten years we've done uh, really really fantastic work in uh, reducing the stigma around mental health and with mental health in the last two years and, and that word well-being has become much more uh, talked about, discussed and how I want to better support my well-being. I want to go for a walk or I want to do the exercise class because it looks after my mental health. And I think it's become uh, a language that we we all have got on board with. Um, within that, we still though have a huge stigma around people with mental illness. So while we're looking after ourselves and promoting positive mental health very well, and, we, and that is fantastic, and we wouldn't want to lose that, uh, the inequality is still there with the mental illness side of the stigma. Um, and as a nation, we need to get better uh, uh, and, and raise more awareness around uh, reducing the stigma around mental illness in my eyes, yeah. I'm just curious as well, in terms, you mentioned during your presentation in terms of the, the digital divide and people have an access to information and obviously the Mental Health Ireland has done a huge amount in respect of uploading information onto the website. Um, and the digital divide has that sort of negative impact obviously in those perhaps who are older within the community. But I also wondered as well, has there been any research in terms of the urban rural divide as well um, in respect of being able to access services uh, regarding mental health? Because um, not everywhere in the country has 5G or 4G broadband and you know, lots of different places where people struggle to get logged in and um, to access services. So I just wondered what sort of measures are in place and what measures would you ideally like to see in place to try and address that? Yeah, like we've seen uh, definitely the urban rural divide is massive for the for the access to 4G internet. Like we think, you know, I'm based in, in Dublin City and, and, you know, as soon as uh, you have instant access for information advice, um, but having worked with different groups, um, just even in different parts of Mayo with young people, um, access or even chatting to, to friends. You know they can't even get that in their home house they have to go away from the home house 
being in a 5k radius you know all this stuff has impacted so yeah the digital divide is still an issue um in ireland i think uh, you know national broadband access needs to be um i suppose implemented especially in those most rural parts because these are the people that are most in need what we found how we uh, uh, i suppose reached out to their, them communities was looking at the um we we rolled out a couple of ad campaigns in um, local papers and it was also trying to work with the local radio stations because we find where the internet access is lower obviously radio um, is where you know a lot of information is is sought and the, and the daytime radio um, chat shows so again it's it's looking at different mediums to reach people on um, and uh, you know alone let's say as, as one of the supports for older adults they you know they had a huge surge in their um, phone line supports after uh, COVID you know it, it used to be face to face and then everything went to phone lines so again um, you know, not everyone had a phone though to access them supports as well. So it's about, I suppose, I, we need to do more research in Ireland into seeing um, how we can better access and support the older adult or the person who doesn't have a smartphone um, and uh, what medium. Um, but again, as I said in, in, in the talk, nothing trumps the face-to-face -face connection. Mm -hmm. um, and especially for that support, it, you know, dig the digitally will bridge a gap for a certain amount of time, but um, it's the face to face in, in our eyes, I think is, is really important for seeking support. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ashley. A uh, question that's come in privately and um, someone has asked that they'd love to know if it's expected that the numbers of those seeking support will continue to increase post COVID. And if so, could this continue growing for a number of years? Um, I suppose the question is, are we yet to see the real effect of COVID and mental health down the line? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. And actually, I think, again, one that our other speakers will be able to answer would would have interesting answers for as well. So I might I might open it to the other speakers as well. But I think for ourselves, um, from what I hear is um, are the, you know, the rates will even itself out. I think we have um, a lot of people who will start to seek. We, we've seen a lot of people who are starting to seek support. Um, at that early intervention stage so that self-help piece so what are the things I can better do to look after my own mental health um, and they will continue to do them good things and I suppose it's it's about taking them good pieces forward uh, the positives um, the extra exercise the connecting with mo people more often over the phone whatever that might be um, in terms of uh, further supports down the line I do believe um, people will start to reach out a bit more because we, when you talk about something, it becomes more um, commonplace to, 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 I suppose, look for, seek help for it as well. And again, back to the stigma comment. Um, but um, again, the, the impacts, I, I suppose, we just don't know for now, um, uh, you know, down the line, how long the impacts might, might stick around with this one, unfortunately. But again, the other speakers may have um, other ideas on that one. Uh I agree with Ashling about this uh, in the sense that, yes, it has had an impact and people are going to seek more support because we're all going through this for a very first time. You know, this pandemic is a new experience for each and every one of us. And something I will be talking about more when I uh, get to my part is that, you know, the impact it has had on each person has been very experiential. And due to that, each person will realize the importance of mental health by themselves. And that is what has led to, you know, more people seeking support because they've started seeing the changes within them. There's a lot of, uh, you know, triggers. People are going to seek more support. Um, and since uh, Ashley mentioned that, you know, the more you talk about it, the more people know that, you know, that you can seek support and you can address this. And awareness is key here. The impact of, of this in the long run um, is something that, we can talk about right now, of course, we don't know what's coming ahead of uh, from here, how long this is going to be and how much uh, we need to develop our coping skills for this. But yes, it is going to have an impact because for a very long time, we are also under a lockdown and we somehow also have adapted to the situation, everyone in a different way. Now, a new normal is going to be something else anyways, because there has been psychological changes in each one of us during this lockdown. We have developed new skills, adaptive skills, and you know techniques to deal with situations. 
In fact, even some safe rules that we give ourselves, like, you know, uh, if I'm stepping out, I tell myself I'm going to be safe if I take safety measures. Now, this is what I'm telling myself, right? And now that the lockdown has gone and we started, we have started stepping out, now my brain is getting tricked. He's like, oh, you were supposed to sit at home before this. And that's how you told yourself you're safe. But now when you're stepping out, your brain's like, but you're, you're stepping out. How are you safe now? Right, so it's going to have an impact, but again, we will. Uh, humans are very adaptable in nature, we will learn skills to adapt through it, but it is surely going to have an impact on us, um, both ways differently in each person. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we might uh conclude the questions for Ashleen at that point. So, thank you very much, Ashleen and Vidya, for uh responding to the, that last question. Um, so I'd like to ask everyone if you want to um, give Ashleen a virtual round of applause. Um, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation, Ashleen, and uh, great to learn about all of the initiatives that uh, Mental Health Ireland are engaging in. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thanks a million. Um, so on that note, I'd like to uh, welcome our next speaker, um, who's Dr. Uh, Vidya Narya. Uh, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Absolutely. Uh, Got it right. Yeah, is a, a doctor and a psychologist by profession with a holistic approach to healing. So um, is the same issues in respect of timekeeping, you'll hear the doorbell from my phone after 10 minutes and then you'll have two minutes to conclude with you. So it's uh, with all yours. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you everyone who's here. And I hope everyone's sitting nice and warm at home because we're all, uh, although it's really cold out there, I understand by hand that it's comparatively colder where you are. I'm calling from India, so it's okay compared to <laughs> the temperatures there. And yeah, so today uh, the topic is mental health and lockdown. And this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier also, you know, we all have had an, an experiential uh, impact during this uh, lockdown, yes. Uh, I do not have a slideshow, but I'm gonna talk about a few things, uh, a few topics I have in mind. And one of the most important things that I think we've all gone through, all of us have gone through during this lockdown is the stages of loss. Now, I don't know if you've ever observed it into your, in yourself when you, uh, you know, got to know about the lockdown and you were like, oh my God, I, I don't think this is, I mean, you know, you heard about other countries, like, you know, it's not gonna happen in my country. Or, you know, I don't think this is real. I mean, it's not so serious. We were all in denial of uh, this whole situation because of course we've never been through it before and we somewhere didn't want it either to come to us and, you know, accept that into us. So we're like, oh no, no, it's not gonna happen to us. Not, not a space we are ever gonna get to, right? So that's something we all went through in the beginning is a denial. Right. And when now when the lockdown actually happened and there's a lot of changes, a lot of things that were not in our control, a lot of things that uh, we couldn't do anything about this a sudden surge of anger, everyone and frustration, everyone went was like, OK, I hate this, that this Corona, you know, everyone was uh, commenting on countries and commenting on uh, why people are not making changes or taking something into control, why people are not doing something about it, a release of anger and frustration, which we went through. Right. And the third part is after that is when we went through a space of, you know, understanding that, okay, uh, you know, somewhere still com not completely accepting it, but they're like, okay, you know, I wish that if we could get out for a day or I wish that, you know, it was not as bad as people are telling me, or I wish this Corona does not spread, and, you know, it's a bargaining state of mind we were in, right? And after that is a state where we understood the effect of it. There is a space when we realize what's really happening around us. And that is where all of us got impacted and was sensing a space of unhappiness, uh, a void maybe also, not knowing what you're going through. It was an emotional turmoil everyone was experiencing and not understanding what it is that we're really going through at this point of time, right? And in the stages of loss, it's called as depression, but for each person that's different, it's an experiential uh, phase that we go through, right? And then eventually when it has been, it has been like three months of lockdown and we now understand the whole scenario. We know that nothing's going to change. This is the new normal. We reach, finally reach a space of acceptance. Maybe some of us haven't yet go, uh, reached that. Some of us are still uh, in denial or anger and frustration and in that space and not reached a level of acceptance to actually acknowledge what the situation is, right? 
but yes we all need to get there to first to deal with the situation because it is a situation we have to adapt to right to to move ahead and to do something about it now the question is what is the reason that we're going through the stages of loss uh, during this uh, situation, right? Why are we going through this? What have we lost here uh, during this lockdown, right? And something I have learned and experienced and observed in my clients and people around us is we have lost our external coping mechanisms. A lot of, most of us, of course, as uh, human beings, as social beings, as a community, we are all obviously dependent on a lot of things outside of us, right? But I think something we've noticed and realized during this time is how much we are dependent on the external resources, right? Of course, it's all needed. We need all of these liabilities and resources that we have outside of us. But how much are we dependent on these external resources? And some people have also understood their internal resources during this lockdown with time. Now, this is what I want to emphasize on from the psychological aspect and uh, you know, make people understand why mental health has suddenly become some you know, talk and people have started realizing that it's important. Uh, people have started seeking help, people have started reaching out and you know, something which should have been always there since the beginning and not the effect of this lockdown. It should have been a normal to seek for help before this. And it should have been something that people should have considered a priority even before this, right? It's because all of a sudden, all those external coping mechanisms, escape spaces, avoidances, all of that has been lost. And now we're all sitting with those thoughts or emotions or uh, behavior patterns, which we were escaping from or distracting ourselves from. And now that that's not available to you know, escape into something, we have to deal with this, right? And what's happening is, we don't know how to deal with it by ourselves. That's because most of us are not very aware of our own internal resources. We as human have our own internal resources and we have our external resources, right? But the internal resources are very much neglected by us through our upbringing and exposure and conditioning. So that brings me to the point is, what is the reason that we do, are not aware about our internal resources? Or what is the reason that it's so neglected? And what is the reason that you know, no one even considers that as important as our external resources? And you know, there's no dependent independency. Is there more, there's more of a dependency in us than an independent nature in us, yes? So, I mean, from what I've experienced and understood, yes, most of our beliefs and concepts are developed in our childhood when we're really, really young. And psychology says this too, first seven to 10 years of your life, is where a child learns concept of self, concept of autonomy, concept of trust. You know, major belief systems are developed there and concepts of how the world is as well. And something which has very commonly been normalized, uh, you know, around us in the world is suppression of emotions. Now, when there is a world where everyone tells you, you know, that's okay, you don't need to speak about it or um, what you say is not important, it's not valid, and you know what you feel or what your skills are, right? So each um, now when I talk about internal resources, it can be your imagination, your creativity, your skills, your cognitive skills, your ability to move, your dancing skills. Each person has different ones. But in our education system, this is what I want to emphasize on. In our education system, I mean, each country has a different education education system, but I don't I don't know if each education system actually emphasizes on our internal resources that much. It's more based on our cognition and academics rather than our imagination, creativity, and other skills which a human has, right? We as individuals, we have all of these internal resources and it's very less focused on that and more focused on the academics and cognition, that's, that's all, right? And in this, we don't understand our own resources. Because a child will like, okay, what do I know? I, I know a particular subject, I have a degree in, and that's all I know. If you ask anyone, even adults, if you ask adults, like, what do you think you're made of? Okay, what do I know? I know I am a psychologist and that's all I know. And that's all I am. But there is more to each and every individual, 
right? And it need not be something which needs validation from outside. It can be just for you. It's your own resource and it can be enough for you. And that's where it stems from. Somewhere down the line, this whole system of education of where, you know, people have been graded and compared to and, uh, you know, made to feel like this is not enough or you need this more, right? It comes from a very deep rooted belief system of feeling not good enough. From a space where you feel like, okay, you know, my academics makes me feel like this is not enough. Maybe like I'm not good, as good as compared to this other student who scored uh, A grade because I got I scored a B grade. Now, what we do in this process is we overlook our other all the other resources that we have, right? So if I'm a good painter, I'm good in arts, maybe that's neglected in this process. And now in this process, what do I start developing? I start developing different coping mechanisms, right? And this coping mechanism that I develop in the long run becomes an unhealthy pattern. So for example, I can, let me work with an example. So an example, if a child um, in school has been told, you know what? Um, yeah, okay, you're dancing and all is good. I mean, it's not that important. Uh, you should focus on your studies because that's what will get you success or that's what will make you feel like you're something in life or you will be, you will reach a space of, um, what do you say? A valid space because each person has a different image in their mind about this is where, you know, life should be or who you should be. And when you reach there, you'll be happy. This is what everyone has been taught, yeah, that our sources of happiness are based on things outside of us, academic, money, and all of these factors, right? So what I would like to tell here is what needs to change here is at a younger level. And I understand people are seeking support here. We are making policies, digital adaptations have happened. And we are trying to adapt to the situation where we're making mental health accessible for everyone and, you know, make them get support and understand what they're going through and overcome the situation. But in the long run, even for the future, we as individuals need to be able to deal with any kind of situations that come in our head, right? You know, Corona is one. I mean, in the future, it can be anything. It can be anything new, just like this situation, which is new to us, right? And we've never experienced it before. To be able to deal with that situation, we need strong internal resources. And that can happen through well-supported and you know, well-aware uh, aware, uh, environment at home and your schooling. And I honestly feel that you know, there's more awareness about mental health. Mental health illnesses and issues needs to be implemented in schools, in PTA meetings, so that people look at it some, at, some, in, at some point of time in their behavior or even how they treat their children or how parents are talking to their children in a perspective of essential part of life and have a more broader perspective to a mind development of a child, yes? And make them more independent rather than dependent uh, individuals of the world, which leads us to not being able to deal with situations that come our way because we don't look into our internal resources to deal with it. Yes, and, and that's, that's why I believe, you know, expression is one of the essential part. Like it's, it's, it's the most simplest thing I could say, you know, expression of emotions actually allows a lot of, of things to happen around you because that's when you know that there is something that you need to deal with. And that can start at, at a school level, you know, having a counselor in every school really can promote children to talk to them parents because you know if you look at it most of people even now as adults find it very difficult to open up to their parents and tell them that you know i'm going through something and what's the reason right so it needs to start at a very younger age and changes need to happen there because that's where the you know our newer generation the future world is yeah I, and that's where i'll end it here and okay. we uh, thank you very much, Fidia. Uh, some really interesting insights. Um, well, I might again abuse my position as the moderator. Uh, it's quite a quite nice position to be in. Um, but some really interesting insights, I thought, uh, uh, during your talk about, I suppose, our lack of awareness of our internal resources. And I suppose I wondered um, what your thoughts were around the impact of technology and our inability to switch off from being constantly stimulated not only for children, but I think for adults as well, you know, whether you have social media pages, whether you have news apps, 
you know, whatever, whatever your fix is, um, you know, with this constant need for information, digital interaction, and that's probably been exacerbated by the fact that we are at home and we have to use technology to communicate. Um, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts around that. I would agree that yes, uh, uh, you know, the digital world has its pros and cons, it's like, you know, double-edged sword right there. But something that we don't realize, uh, you know, when we access and take in so much information on a regular basis, and, uh, you know, we don't realize how dependent we are becoming on it. And at the same time, you know, what are we doing when, like, for example, now as well, when I'm talking to you on the screen, you know, my mind is on the screen with you, but my body is here in India. Mm. Yes. So what am I creating? There's a dissociation here. I am not connected to my body right now. Yes. And there is an absolute dissociation of your mind and body at the moment. Now, what is happening now when you're regularly dissociating your mind and body is where you're not understanding what's happening inside of you because you're not connected. How will you be aware of what's, what you're really going through, what you're experiencing in your body or your mind when you're not here with your body? Yes. And yes, that needs to be developed as a practice because as I said, it's a double-edged sword. We cannot live in this world without this digital mm -hmm. technology and the information that we have because it's needed for our survival and adaptation in this scenario. But at the same time, we also need to understand that yes, our mind and body needs to be more with us than on something external to us, right? And that comes with being more mindful of yourself, being more mindful of anything that you do, you know, and something that I can advise each and every one here is simple things like, you know, how many of us when we eat food, actually keep our phone or laptop away and uh, enjoy that meal, right? It's as simple as that, right? You know, at that moment itself also, we're not allowing ourselves to enjoy that one moment we have. And these little moments are what makes us ourselves, you know, has makes it wholesome. But we are devoiding ourselves from these moments and then depending on something outside, which is our source of also a lot of triggers, by the way. As you mentioned, there's a lot of information coming our way, which is also a source of various triggers within us. And we don't realize that. Yes. So being more mindful of your own self, just even bodily, will increase much more awareness about yourself to get to action because that's the first step. Awareness is the first step to even addressing anything in life. Okay. And um, there's a question has come through in the chat box. Um, are the internal resources effective while the lockdown continues? So... Uh, we might take that question and then if there's any further questions maybe we'll leave them to the end of the session just i want to sure. ensure louise has time uh, for her presentation as well so if you'd like to address that Fizia. sure yes the internal resources are absolutely effective during the lockdown because so i can give you a simple example right now the external resources they were here before the lockdown and now they're not there so in the future we might not know if they're there or not there right and how long it will be there but your internal resources will always be there with you. That is something you can rely on forever in your life because what's in your control is only you. Your thoughts, your emotions, your skills, your imagination, your creativity, that's in your control. And this is a fact even before lockdown that anything outside of us is not in our control. And that's something also we all need to accept and realize that, you know, yes, things can happen outside of us and it's not in my control. But what I can control is what is happening inside of me, how I look at these things outside of me, and how I perceive these things outside of me. If I feel like I have all my resources to deal with the situation, and when I mean resources, it also means my image about myself, right? My self-confidence, how I feel towards myself, how I treat myself. If I have, if that is healthy, I think I can deal with anything in life, right? If I have reached that space in my mind. Right. And if you feel like your internal resources and most of us uh, have not reached complete levels of, you know, strength of internal resources, each one has their own, uh, you know, ratio of each resource. But yes, you need to strengthen them so that you can deal with anything in your future and be able to adapt to that situation better because you, know, you can depend on yourself forever. 
Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, and if we'd all like to, to thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Fithia Nair. Sorry, apologies, I've mispronounced your name. Um, but thank you very much for a really okay. interesting talk. So thank you. Um, so I think you're able to stay on uh, for another little while. And if there's any other further questions, uh, you know, in relation to your presentation, if um, participants want to stick it into the chat box and we can ask them at the end of the session. Um, but before then, I'd like to hand over to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Louise Campbell, who's based in NUI Galway. Um, and uh, Louise has been involved in as part of a subgroup advising NEFIT uh, in respect of ethical decision making and guidelines. So um, the floor is all yours, Louise, with the usual uh, you'll have the 10 minute doorbell warning um, and then that'll let you know that you have two minutes left. But if you need a bit of extra time after the two minutes, it, it should be OK. So the floor is all yours, Louise. So. so thank you, Brenda. And um, thank you, Natika, for the invitation. And thank you to everybody who's here. Uh, Vidya, I couldn't I don't know how to work the little virtual clap. So I just was trying to clap with my own hands. I hope you saw that. Yes, I did. Thank you so your much. Presentation. So um, I, this is going to be a different kind of talk. I'm an ethicist and I teach medical ethics and law. So um, I'm very interested in I'm very interested in public health ethics. And I was before um, we ever got into this um, COVID situation. So my brief is to talk to you just um, very quickly about uh, public health decision making. So that kind of ties in with what Brenda says there. I, I, I got asked to sit on the pandemic ethics advisory group which was the ethics um, advisory group for NEFIT for the National Public Health Emergency Team here. Uh, I, I didn't have any um, connection with NEFIT at all. We were just writing ethics documents that were supposed to inform uh, decision-making during the pandemic. And I'm not actually sure uh, what happened to any of those documents or whether they informed anything, but we wrote them anyway, several of them. And they're all up there on the Department of Health website if anybody goes in there and googles ethics you'll find them so i'm going to start with i want to look at very generally i hope this is going to be interesting for people um just what public health ethics is and how public health uh decisions are made and what ethical constraints are on those are on that kind of decision making so if we look at um uh, the Institute of Medicine's definition of public health from 1988. They say that public health is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions for people to be healthy. So I think this is a really good starting point. Public health ethics is very different from, um, you know, what I know to be the case in, say, medical ethics or clinical or ethics in the clinical setting, because um, ethics in the clinic focuses on individual interests, individual autonomy, individual rights and individual concepts of well-being, whereas public health focuses obviously on population health, the health of an entire uh, community or, or, or a nation. Second, whereas healthcare ethics or clinical ethics emphasizes autonomous decision making, public health ethics emphasizes collectivity, cooperation and mutual obligation. These are very, very different domains of decision making. Uh, healthcare ethics values privacy and freedom from interference, and public health ethics focuses on um, something broader, which is sort of assumptions about the common good. And of course, how we agree as a nation on what constitutes the common good is a very uh, difficult thing to ascertain, um, really, as you can imagine. So, public health ethics is um, tied to, uh, but not reducible to, um, political decision making, it's, it's associated with political decision, decision making and government action. So we've all seen this, um, all of us in our, whatever jurisdiction we live in, because our governments are making these decisions, but they're advised by uh, people who work in the domain of public health. So politics and public health are coming together in a very um, conspicuous way um, in, in terms of the restrictions that are then devised to um, I guess, I guess, minimize harm and promote health in society uh, during in the context of something like uh, what we're going through at the moment, a pandemic. So before I, I say what I'm going to say in a second, I just want to emphasize the fact that um, not everybody in society has an equal opportunity to be healthy. So I guess everybody listening knows this or an equal opportunity even to access healthcare. There are all sorts of reasons um, why there's inequity um, between say citizens, even in a given um, jurisdiction. And there's considerable inequities or inequalities in health. So 
there's a vast range of levels of healthiness in society and those are not all matters of individual decisions taken to engage in risky behaviors or um, engage in sort of um, unhealthy behaviors. They are often related to systemic factors such as um, availability um, of resources and access to resources and barriers preventing people from accessing resources importantly. So public health focuses on not only improving health at a population level, like making the health of a nation better aggregatively as an aggregate um, of individuals who are more healthy, but it also focuses on reducing health inequality. So trying to make those who are sort of uh, maybe at a greater disadvantage, try to, trying to bring up the, the playing field, trying to make it more level to create uh, more equal opportunities for health and reduce uh, health inequities to improve the health of the worst off groups in society, so to speak. So a question that public health decision makers has to ask, or anybody interested in public health actually can have, probably should be asking this, how should society decide, like society via its government, how should it decide whether to intervene to protect the public's health and safety when doing so will diminish our personal or economic interests? So we can all see how our personal interests and maybe our economic interests in the case of people who have who have lost businesses or whose businesses are on the brink we can see how our those interests are diminished um, because we have been required to um, observe certain measures uh, required by um, our public health authorities in our various jurisdictions this just doesn't just apply to ireland it applies to any country where restrictions are in place during the covid pandemic so if a public health intervention, so the question is, how do we, how do, how does society decide whether or not to intervene? And if an intervention um, is decided upon or introduced by a government with the aim of protecting the health of the public, it requires justification. So it requires justification on five counts. First of all, um, the risk that the intervention is designed to address or mitigate must be clearly defined and the evidence underlying, underlying claims about how serious the risk is and what the nature of the risk is must be provided. Um, so these are all very good questions for NEFIT and any public health um, 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 statutory body. Second, the effectiveness of the intervention in addressing or mitigating the risk in question must be, must be demonstrated. Third, the economic cost of implementing the intervention and any opportunities lost by implementing it um, must be assessed. So this is all happening, you know, as we proceed through the, the next stages of COVID. Fourth, any potential interference with the human rights of the population must be assessed. Um, and whether or not the intervention is fair must be examined. So does it place a disproportionate burden, economic burden or other type of burden on specific population groups? So in a lockdown, for example, somebody who lives by the sea and has a beautiful garden and plenty of space um, might not feel um, so burdened by the, risk, the two kilometer restriction as somebody who's living five kilometers from a park in a busy concrete jungle part of the city. Um, so these are all um, factors that have to be taken into consideration. So the risk must be demonstrated, the effectiveness of the intervention must be demonstrated, the economic cost must be assessed, so too should the burdens on human rights and the fairness of the intervention. Now, um, I'm just going to just give you a very brief mention of the um, principles that we were using, um, or the, pub, the Pandemic Ethics Advisory Group were sort of recommending that the government used in implementing public health interventions and restrictions. Um, I should say that um, there are certain values that generally underpin any public health intervention in a functioning democratic society. So the, the points that I just mentioned were in relation to how a government or a public health authority justifies um, implementing certain types of interventions and maybe by doing so compromising individual rights and liberties. But um, there's values, we could call the values that underpin or are the foundation for any public health intervention in a functioning democratic society. So I guess one of these values is transparency. It must be really clear to the public how decisions are made in relation to the implementation of these measures, by whom they're made. Um, again, they're entitled to information about the evidence base and the quality of the evidence, you know, if they want it, I mean, um, as well as any uncertainty about the evidence base. Um, 
interventions again should be designed in a way that pay attention to the specific needs of groups deemed vulnerable. So I guess in the context of this discussion here, um, it could um, validly be asked how, uh, whether uh, um, not just what the mental health implications of the public health restrictions that we are currently experiencing are, but whether these restrictions are disproportionately affecting um, persons living with pre-existing uh, mental illness. And I think this is a really important uh, question and I would have really liked to ask Ashling, but I didn't get my act together on time. Anyway, and she's gone now. So, um, and these interventions also need to be fairly and consistently, uh, consistently implemented. They shouldn't deepen any existing uh, disadvantage in society. And they should restrict people's rights and liberties as minimally as possible. Am I still okay for time, Brenda? You're just coming up to the two minute oh, mark. No. So we need to, okay, I'll finish really fast. We need to um, achieve a balance between competing rights, rights, um, competing rights of individuals uh, among individuals and their interests and values. We need to avoid discrimination against particular groups and individuals, and we shouldn't um, implement anything that um, I guess exacerbates inequity. So the goals of any public health response should be to minimize the negative health impacts of the pandemic and to try and maintain a functioning society. So that's, I guess, what um, what they're trying to do. But in this kind of situation, constraints on the needs, preferences, and sometimes even autonomy interests of individuals may be necessary in order to prioritize the well-being of the population at large. And there should be a focus on the needs of vulnerable groups deemed vulnerable. And I don't mean that in a patronizing way. So our pandemic decision-making were informed was informed by, um, well, I hope it was informed by the following ethical principle, seven of them, the minimization of harm. So trying to minimize the, as I said, the effects of the pandemic on the health of the population using a variety of means. Um, proportionality. So the, implement, the implemented measures should be um, as little restrictive as possible of people's human rights and freedoms. Um, the principle of solidarity, which calls for a collaborative approach um, which means kind of setting aside individual self-interest at some level and territorialism as well in terms of um, allocating resources and services. So sharing and cooperating, basically. Fairness. This is really important. So everyone should have an equal chance to benefit from health resources and an equal chance of receiving them. So you may or not may be aware of a debate that was going on about um, thresholds for access to ICU and whether people with pre-existing um, chronic conditions or disabilities would be as likely to benefit from ICU um, admission as people without those conditions. And of course they wouldn't. And the question is, um, why is there a threshold then for ICU admission? So they, this was a discussion that originated in Italy back in March when the ICUs were completely overwhelmed and only those people that were most likely to benefit were actually um, admitted. There's a duty to provide care and alleviate suffering. So healthcare professionals then have to balance their professional obligations against competing duties in their own lives, like duties to look after elderly relatives or uh, children, or maybe people with a, a pre-existing medical condition. There's a, the principle of solidarity, oh, sorry, reciprocity. Society must support those who shoulder a disproportionate burden in promoting the public good or who expose themselves to additional risks. So that is healthcare professionals. Um, and people who work in congregated settings, social care professionals, etc. And of course, the principle of privacy needs to be upheld. I think I'll have to finish there. I had a few other tiny little things to say, but I think that's probably more than enough for me for for now. And um, I think it's a it's a good place to stop. So thank you very much for listening. And please, um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, sorry to cut you short. I think oh, not at all. Uh, I think with all of our speakers, we could quite happily give you lots of extra time, but uh, it's, it's always the way with these events. Um, there's a question has come into the chat box um, uh, whereby the, the person has asked, people who have uh, an unstable mental illness, are they more affected? Um, is the risk for elderly um, bigger regarding mental illness or are other groups more at risk? Um, so it, open that up to yourself, Louise, or Fethia, if you if you want to come in as well. So I can only answer that anecdotally, and I definitely would be the least qualified on the panel to, um, to I, I think, to, to address it. Um, I, I, I guess I would imagine that um, people who maybe um, have a 
sort of a lower resilience perhaps and I'm not saying that anybody with um, unstable mental illness is less resilient because they're often more resilient in many regards but I would say that resilience is a really important factor in um, whether or not people are sort of affected by by something like this and I think um, that you know the elderly um, with mental issue with mental health issues may be uh, doubly uh, vulnerable and may also lack resilience in relation to being able to you know you know protect themselves or maybe even advocate for their own interests so I'm not really answering that question very well I would say the answer is yes but I can only answer it sort of from an anecdotal perspective rather than anything concrete mm -hmm. um yeah no, I suppose I have a question for you Louise again I'm going to abuse my position as moderator tonight um, I'm really taking advantage um, and I know that you mentioned that you were involved with the subgroup in producing this document um, which is to be used by the different hospital bodies and, and health boards and so on um, and I suppose the, the value of that certainly if you've identified those ethical issues and questions around decision making and I think one of the the big issues is certainly in respect of access to services you know and that's part of the reason why we've had such uh, particularly during the second phase of lockdowns, you know, we went back into lockdown again. It's, you know, why why was that necessary? And it was access to resources was one of the big issues and one of the big problems. Um, and very difficult decisions are having to be made by the healthcare teams responsible for the treatment of patients. And you rightly identify that, you know, decisions are being made around, well, say for example, an older person, so an 85 year old with perhaps lots of underlying health conditions, um, do they get access to the ventilator over and above someone who's in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, who has less or no underlying health conditions? So, um, you know, how, how challenging do you think it is for those healthcare teams in respect of having to make those ethical decisions? I think that's a really good question, Brenda, and I think... Um... It is extremely challenging and I wouldn't like to be on the front line at all. You know, it's very easy for me to sit here like I'm just a gumshoe kind of making these, uh, you know, writing down these sort of analyses. But I guess, you know, um, healthcare workers in Italy and in the States and in Spain were completely traumatized by the fact that they had to make these decisions. You know, they had to impose an age threshold and the age threshold wasn't related to the age necessarily of the person it was related to the person's likelihood to benefit, which unfortunately declines with age. So age wasn't the primarily primary marker, but potential to benefit is one of the sort of really important, I guess, ethical principles in all of these types of decisions. Um, but it, but it, age was still a proxy for that, which was very unfortunate. And I think um, the key, just to, uh, to not be too long-winded about it, um, uh, healthcare organizations and um, sort of you know, ethics bodies around the world have recommended that no individual clinicians should be responsible for making these resource allocation decisions. They should have triage committees who are not um, part of the um, team that cares for the patient. And then there's a certain de um, degree of impartiality and they can look at sort of um, clinical markers and likelihood to benefit in that context rather than um, having somebody who might be a little bit more, um, a bit less impartial because they're actually emotionally involved or invested in the survival of the patient. So that's one way of getting around those decisions, but it's still, it's removing at one level, but it's still a very difficult decision to make. Yeah. And I don't envy them. Neither do I. And you certainly make a very good point. And I think in, I sort of linked into um, both Ashley's paper and what Vivia was talking about as well in terms of the internal resources. If you look particularly for the healthcare professionals on the front line and their mental health and the the likelihood of post-traumatic stress disorder i think we're going to be dealing with that. in many ways if you think back to previous world wars there has been that whole discussion of soldiers coming back from the front line and suffering long-term ptsd which wasn't identified or acknowledged i think in many ways those healthcare workers who are on the front line um you know, we certainly will need a huge amount of assistance and help for their own health and well-being in, or, in order to enable them to look after us should we need it um, as well. Um, there's another question that's come in for you, Louise. Um, and the question is, would you believe that the vaccine should be enforced by law if it's for the greater good? So really interesting question. Yeah, very interesting question. Very hard question. Thank you, Rowan, for putting me on the spot there. Um, so I, no, I'm only joking. Um, I think that it is very difficult to justify mandatory vaccination from an ethical perspective. I think you're 
so um, the greater good in your um, in your in your question there uh, should be in inverted commas, I would say, because we would have there's very deep disagreements in society based on people's different value systems about what constitutes what is for the greater good. And some people, you know, have and there's very deep disagreements about vaccination generally, as you probably know. And um, so I would be scared, a little bit scared about this vaccine because of the rap rapidity with which it was developed. So I would like to see a longer um, a longer time to proof of concept and safety and efficacy. But that is my personal view. And I don't expect anybody necessarily to agree with that. But I certainly think that um, nobody should be forced to be vaccinated until we have a step. There shouldn't be a mandatory vaccination anyway. But I think um, the question of vaccination should be tied really closely to an established profile, the established safety and efficacy profile of the vaccine so that nobody is exposed um, to, uh, to significant risks prematurely. And I think there are other ways of mitigating the problem other than vaccination. So behavioral changes can, um, can protect people as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, you know, I think many people would share your concerns, Louise, around I suppose the speed of development of the vaccine. Albeit that lots, of, and I read an article uh, over the weekend, and it was a, a scientist based at Cambridge University in the UK, and his explanation was normally when you're applying for approval for vaccines, there can be all sorts of issues around trying to get funding from different groups to test the vaccine. Um, support to recruit for you know different volunteers who are willing to participate as part of the trials and so on um, so it was quite an interesting article in that he kind of explained a lot of the time where things that he's been involved in which have taken maybe five to ten years it's more that waiting around for relevant committees research ethics committees to be constituted to review applications to give approval all of those other factors as well um, can be an issue too um, you know, but it's not without its concern. I think everyone, you know, lots of people have kind of concerns and worries. Is this being rushed through? Has it been properly tested um, before we take it? But I would agree with you in respect of not having mandatory vaccination, certainly from a legal perspective, it would completely go against our constitutional rights, our right to bodily integrity, um, uh, which is very well established constitutional right that we have a right to decide what happens to our bodies. Um, you know, and there are some people for whatever reasons just aren't comfortable with the notion of taking a vaccine. Um, and I think you're right as well to point out there are other measures and even some of the, the leading um, experts in the world, I think was a professor Von Tam in the UK. And he stated recently that even with the vaccine, which has been approved by the UK Medicines Health Regulatory Authority, that people will still need to wear a mask. It won't be a case of, I've got the vaccine, I can throw away my mask, I don't need to worry about social distancing or hand washing, um, that everything else goes to the wayside, that it's just one tool as part of a suite of options that need to be uh, introduced to address the, the virus. Um, so that's certainly a couple of questions or comments have come in as well. Um, from other participants saying that they're not anti-vax, but would agree that it should be the individual's choice. Um, and that there are lots of ethical issues um, around, I suppose, and an important point in terms of testing on animals in the early stages as well, that many people feel, feel very uncomfortable with that. Um, and I think even as well in terms of the some of the trials have been perhaps in poorer parts of the world, where there's perhaps more vulnerable people and there have been issues in the past whereby individuals have been encouraged to participate unknowingly and unwittingly in certain vaccine trials um, and it was on the promise of access to healthcare. Um, I think it was in Alabama in the 1930s in America where um, quite poor black sharecroppers were recruited. Um, I think it was the test, it was it a, the drug, the medication for syphilis or some of those sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and they were encouraged to participate because they were told that they would be provided with free health, free health care and free meals. Um, so there are other ethical issues, I think, that arise with that. So I don't know, um, Louise, if you have any further thoughts or uh, our other speaker, uh, Fithia, I'll, I'll shut up. I'm the moderator. I shouldn't be talking as much um, if you want to, to come back and uh, contribute. 
I absolutely appreciate appreciate the information that you're providing because it is essential, Brenda. So I'm glad that you're interfering and giving your perspective and point of view. I would like to uh, address a question which was mentioned earlier about people who have uh, unstable mental illnesses or elderly people uh, being affected more during this time. Yes, uh, during this time, people who already have been uh, experiencing uh, anxiety or depression or any mental health issue. As uh, I think uh, uh, Louise mentioned that, you know, it's not about uh, that, you know, someone who has mental illness is not resilient. In fact, some of them have developed very good uh, coping mechanisms, healthy coping mechanisms to deal with that situation, right? But at the same time, there might be something that might have got triggered during this time, which they were not aware of, right? Which might cause a relapse, which has been observed uh, during the lockdown, yes? That being said, in elderly, now elderly, the disadvantage here is because most elderly are, uh, there is some kind of cognitive and physical disability which develops with age. Yes, there is a neurogenerate, you know, neuro uh, degenerative diseases, right? So there is a degeneration which happens at a neuron level, which is natural to age. And in some, it might be negligible. In some, might, it might not be noticeable. Some, it might be. And during this time, what is needed is support more uh, during that age from your loved ones, more resources needed during this time. And that being cut down during this time might have an impact on them because some elderly also live alone, right? You know, there's a lot of elderly people which I know uh, during this lockdown have been living alone um, by themselves or with their partners and not being able to access their loved ones. And when you reach that age, uh, you know, your most of your life is uh, looking forward to what you already have, and that's your loved ones, and you know the moments with them, all your memories, and cherish time with them because they really don't have any work or uh, something that keeps them really occupied during the day, which where they can put their mental capacity and you know use that time for themselves. It's mostly dependent on things that they have as family or social systems, right? And that being cut off, cut off has affected them adversely, right? But then again, I've also seen this is from my grandma's side that I say, even the elderly have very well adapted uh, to the digital technology uh, during this time. And it's amazing to see that, right? I have seen a lot of the elderly who have started using Zoom calls, uh, YouTube, WhatsApp calls, and try to adapt to the situation. So yes, that also has been observed, right? Depending on each person's uh, resilience, as uh, Louis mentioned, yes, for each one, it is different. Okay, thank you very much. Uh yes, there needs to be more focus on prevention and improving immunity because that also mentally, if you look at it, it does build, build mental resilience because we understand and we feel like we're capable of dealing with the situation. If you are physically strong, if we feel like our immunity is you know, well uh, sustainable during this time that we can go through this even if something happens to us, right? Because a belief a lot of people have that, you know, if, if I get corona, I don't think I'll be able to deal with it. You know, my body will not be able to take it. So that trust in, in your physical ability and strength is very less than a lot of people. So yes, you need to focus on your own physical strength and your own, uh, you know, uh, immunity and your weaknesses as well, by the way where you can work on and, you know, improvise that. And I think one of the challenges as well with COVID is that it seems to affect different people very differently. Yeah. Um, and there are all sorts of, I suppose, the lo long COVID suffers, not only in terms of the, the physical manifestation of the illness, but the, the mental health effect that it's had. And it's, it has affected different people quite differently in, you know, sort of, um, I suppose in terms of how they've responded physically to it, their treatment, how they've recovered and everything else, but it's, it does seem to have had quite a negative impact in that regard. Um, so thanks Louise for the, the reference to the Tuskegee um, study, which is the study that I was referring to. Um, and uh, that was um, the, the, the public health trial that was carried out in America between 1932 and 1972. Um, and then uh, Louise has noted as well that the ex-editor of the New England Journal of Medicine has also claimed that the trials of the early um, 
antiretroviral medications for HIV in Africa were almost a repetition of Tuskegee. Um, and I suppose it does raise concerns and questions, and I suppose as ethicists, as medical practitioners, as lawyers, um, and everyone else in the room, you do have that question at the back of your mind in terms of the trials, the vaccine trials themselves. How have people been recruited for them? You know, within, I think if you look towards say the UK and Ireland, it's been much more on that voluntary basis where if you want to participate, people stepped up and sort of volunteered to participate. I know certainly within the UK for the Oxford study, um, where that, and that still hasn't sort of, um, been approved or anything yet in terms of the, the drug that they have or the treatment that they've developed. But there were many members of the National Health Service who stepped forward as volunteers for it. Um, I've come across a couple of interviews where relatives of patients who died from COVID volunteered for it because they kind of thought, well, I have nothing else to lose. My loved one died from this illness. I want to do something to help contribute towards the fight of it to stop other people ending up in the position that I'm in. Um, and I suppose that was their perhaps the, them using their internal resources and to become more resilient in terms of dealing with it themselves. Um, but it does, for me as a lawyer, it does raise questions about the ethical approval of the trials and how people have been recruited. And I suppose it's with that knowledge of knowing what has happened in the past um, regarding vulnerable groups. So um, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Louise or uh, Vidya, in respect of the recruitment of vulnerable parties or the administration even of the vaccine to vulnerable groups because they, obviously it's the the older persons and persons within residential homes who seem to be in the list of priority for receiving the vaccination um, certainly within sort of Ireland and within the UK I'm not sure what approach has been taken in, in India um, if a similar approach has been taken there regarding age and vulnerabilities in respect of administration of the vaccine. Well, I'm not sure what's happening in India, but <laughs> so I will have to answer that one. But um, yeah, I think I'm not anti-vax. Um, I'm not really sure what anti-vax is, but I, you know, I wouldn't categorize myself in that way. But I think what's really needed is a very um, robust public discussion about safety, efficacy, evidence, the quality of the evidence, how like how the trials were conducted. You know, not everyone is going to want to hear about this or listen to it, but it would be, it's mm -hmm. really important to have a robust discussion and for the information to be transparent and clear and out there in the public domain. And then, you know, maybe for some, I think science outreach is really, this is another kind of jump to another topic, but it's really important in something like this discussion you know because we're not all equipped to know what say a randomized controlled trial is mm -hmm. but um you know these are things that can be explained by scientists you know doing sort of public outreach work and it's really important i think to if you're going to engage the public to be talking a language that they can you know that they can understand and i don't mean that in a patronizing way you know it took me a long time to you know work out what the medical literature was saying mm -hmm. and i still don't know a lot of the time mm -hmm. so you know, it's a it's an uphill struggle, and I think, um, but robustness and transparency are really important. Uh, Fidia, what about uh, the position in India? If you any anything to add? No, I'm not expecting you to know everything. I, I appreciate I'm putting you on the spot somewhat. I understand, yes, but in India, they've not really started a proper trial as such. It's st still under speculation about uh, if it is going to be. Also, uh, something which Louis mentioned about is transparency. Right now, I don't know how it is in Ireland, but you know, everywhere I feel what we see and what is really happening, there is a big gap right there, right? And uh, I do sense that in India as well, in a lot of things, right? And yes, it is important, you know, transparency and uh, keeping it robust is important. In fact, ethically, it's very much needed so that people know and can easily take a decision for themselves so that they have that clear knowledge about what it is and then they can decide for themselves. Yes, but sadly there is a lack there. You know, there is a lack of uh, that knowledge that about what is really going on, how efficient it is, uh, what is the viability, right? Is it really going to help us? Is it really needed? You know, basic questions like that. And yes, I agree with Louis that, you know, scientists and people who are working on it need to spread that information very clearly 
you know, put that information out there for people and then they can decide what they want to do with it. And it need not be mandatory, but at least they can understand and decide then what they want to do with it. And they have a choice there. But without knowledge and with half knowledge, it's it's very uncomfortable for anyone to make a decision with half knowledge about anything, right? It's like, you know, I don't know, but how can I choose? Right? So yes, more transparency and robust discussions are needed about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a very valid point in terms of the need for transparency and robustness. Um, I just wondered as well, um, you know, there's been um, a number of newspaper reports over the past few days that some of our politicians, the Taoiseach, the Tanisha, um, Dr. Tony Holohan, um, who's the chair of NEFIT, are, you know, they're caught, well, I'm not sure if Tony Holohan has actually stated he will take the vaccine publicly. I think there were calls for him to appear on a very popular TV show, The Late Late Show, uh, Vidya, um, and to show Tony Holohan, who's the chief medical officer, being given the vaccine live on screen. But I just wondered in terms of that issue of transparency and trust, do you think it's an important message for the population? And I suppose in respect of assurance over um, the vaccination that it's been through proper procedures, albeit in a much uh, that it's gone through sort of the approval process in a much quicker format it's been developed much more quickly than we would expect do you think that that's reassuring for the general population um that our politicians have indicated that they will take it so yes i understand that you know the speed with which the vaccine has been developed and uh you know uh, there is no particular vaccine which has been developed so fast and been put into use and from the knowledge that we have, right? From the research that we know and the knowledge that we have, we, how we know vaccines work, how we know vaccines have been used and implemented. If we look at it from that perspective, of course, it's going to be met with skepticism for each one. So I don't think, I mean, even if uh, we do have, as you mentioned, someone famous took it on uh, TV, right? Okay, maybe for some major uh, people who have lack of knowledge about this, about how vaccines work or uh, what is the real process or information about the viability and, you know, in fact, what a vaccine really is and what it does, right? For them, they might be assured by it. But for people who really do have the knowledge about this, uh, you know, how it works and what needs to be done to actually implement it, it will be met with skepticism. But then that being said, how much of our population does actually know about uh, the vaccine or how it works and Right, you know, uh, what is the what is it made of even, and how it works on you. Right, so that is a big question here, and and that's why I said you know a, a transparency about every basic knowledge about it should be there so that they know and make a choice about it. But it's not there as you know, there is a lack. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Louise. Do you want to, to come in? I know there's a couple of questions coming in the chat box as well, but if you want to address my question first. <laughs> I agree with Vidya. I think um, it's not going to convince everybody. I think it might be, I am a little bit worried about it. I saw Clinton and Obama and George W. Bush, what a trio, all said that they would take it in public as well. And so this is a political motivation for a public health intervention. And this is quite unprecedented, I think, actually, mm -hmm. um, historically, um, as far as I know, you know, to have this kind of... Um, these, this heavyweight support of uh, sort of mass vaccination. And mm -hmm. I, I, the same concerns, Brenda, are still surfacing, you know, until the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine is well established, I think, you know, and I completely appreciate what you said about the Oxford researcher who was saying, you know, that there were all sorts of hurdles that researchers have to jump through, you know, but, um, um, and, and I can appreciate that that is, the, mm -hmm. that there's, validity to that point but um i think this is a this is a different set of issues and i think that it might pro provide false reassurance to people but anyway i think people should uh, make the decision for themselves without being influenced by what their politicians are doing and um certainly a politician that doesn't know anything about um sort of uh scientific research in the area in which they're recommending the vaccine i wouldn't say that that would hugely reassure me Mm -hmm. But I just wouldn't like people to be falsely reassured or to um, be unduly influenced to be mm -hmm. vaccinated. Yeah, and I think that's linked into the, the legal principles around informed consent that, yeah. you know, the basic line of any informed consent in law is, 
you have to be provided with the relevant information that you can make that decision for yourself, that it has to be made voluntarily, that, you know, it shouldn't be mandatory. Um, and I don't know, I think there are some people, if they heard that certain politicians were taking the vaccine, it would probably be a good reason for them to decide not to take it um, just in those political grounds. So um, I know there's just a question to the panel has come through in terms of uh, classifying psychological harm as a vulnerability, given that the vaccine is to go to the vulnerable first. Um, and I think specifically it asks, Louise, should we consider psychological vulnerability as uh, sort of vulnerable people? Um, and I appreciate, Louise, you have to, lo to, to leave uh, soon as well. So if you want to quickly answer that. So I think that uh, vulnerability really, it's a very tr tricky, it's a multifaceted concept and a very tricky one to define. I think really over overarchingly what vulnerability is, is an, a, you know, maybe a, a person lacking the resources to maybe advocate for their own interests or speak up with their own voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that psychological um, factors can influence that. So absolutely, I do think there's a psychological vulnerability as well as, you know, there's so societal, socio, socio sorry, socio-emotional vulnerability, there's physical vulnerability, mm -hmm. there's a number of different types of vulnerability. And um, I guess, you know, I guess there is a duty on society to protect the vulnerable, but also by the same token, um, to enhance their autonomy as, 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 mm -hmm. as far as possible as well. That's great. And Vidya, do you want to add anything or? Right. So again, um, there, as I as uh, Louise mentioned, autonomy is important here, but the, uh, it depends. Now, when you say psychological vulnerable, it's going to be a big spectrum. In my mind, when I think about it, it's a big spectrum that comes uh, when you talk about psychologically vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it comes in even physical vulnerability, emotional vulnerability, it's a big spectrum. Now, I don't understand on what basis is that being uh, assessed or judged to decide who should be given oh, the vaccine or not. Mm -hmm. But if you would ask me personally and tell, ask me if psychological vulnerability is, should be uh, something wrong with me, vulnerability should be considered as a, a person who's vulnerable and should be given a vaccine first, I would assess it. I would maybe have a panel to assess it, uh, maybe a mental health professional uh, to assess it and understand if they can make a choice and decision for themselves. And they're in that state of mind to do it because there is a difference between physical disability and uh, mental disability, right? Physical disability does not uh, hamper your cognition and your comprehension of things. So even if you're physically disabled and your cognition is good, you can take a choice there. But psychologically speaking, if your cognition is, has been hampered and affected due to an illness, maybe you cannot. So maybe then you might need someone who is a caretaker or someone who's supportive a parent or guide with them to be able to take that choice. So I don't know on what spectrum this decision is being made as of now and considered. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it kind of raises lots of many interesting points. And I think especially if you, you rightly pointed out the fact that there is a huge difference between someone who is physically disabled as opposed to someone who perhaps suffers from um, mental health issues. And, you know, there are provisions in law, like under the legislation, the mental health legislation within Ireland does make provision for certain categories of persons who have been detained under that legislation where there are supports available. Our courts have been very good in terms of helping those who are incapacitated in respect of their decision making, trying to protect autonomy. But I just, I think it just, it, it opens up so many questions um, and concerns for those who perhaps don't have that support in place, but actually do need help to protect their autonomy, their right to make a decision for themselves and their right to decide to consent to accepting um, the vaccine. A very good comment in the chat box, which I'll, I'll read out. You don't need to make the vaccine mandatory if you can influence people using social proof and I suppose scientific proof as well, I think for a lot of people would be very important. Um, and she rightly points out that in conditions of uncertainty, people will refer to others around them to decide what to do. And using politicians or other people who have influence over society should not be allowed, neither should the manipulation of media to influence people's individual decisions. Um, I think that's a fantastic comment. Um, I think you're right in terms of, it almost seems with, you know, sort of Obama, Clinton and Bush getting on board, I think Joe Biden as well. Now with the Irish politicians stating that they will, uh, you know, have the vaccine live, um, you know, it's, 
I, I don't think that's helpful for some people. Um, and I think as well, sort of the role of the media and I think online media, the big tech companies, the likes of Facebook, Twitter, where they're perhaps allowing um, certain ideas and theories to be falsely um, propagated online, um, that they have a huge responsibility as well. Um, you know, so because so many people get their information through social media as well, and they're they're not able to discern for themselves what's true, what's based in fact, or what's fake news. Um, to quote from uh, a current U.S. president. Um, so I think we'll leave it there. I know that uh, Louise has to to leave. She has another deadline, um, and uh, I feel your pain, Louise. There's no more bars in the day. Um, so I'd just like to thank both Louise and Fidia. Uh, so we've had. Uh, our speakers from Galway, from Dublin, from Delhi in India. So truly international seminar this evening. So thank you both uh, so for your very interesting talks. Um, thanks all of you for your questions as well uh, in the chat box. And uh, thanks to the organizers. And um, so uh, Natika, uh, I can see Analika. I know there's lots of others who are involved as well in the background. So thanks to, to everyone if I haven't specifically uh, mentioned your names. So. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening um, and uh, we can all weigh up our decisions as to whether or not we want to take a vaccine and whether Michal Martin taking it and Leo Faradkar will make us take a vaccine or put us off a vaccine. Um, but I would say about get all the information, make your own mind up. So we'll leave it there. So thank you very much. So a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you very much everyone and thank you Brenda for sharing. Yes, thank you so much, Brenda, for being a lovely moderator and being so attractive with us. Yes, it was lovely to be here. Thank you, Louise, Nithika, you, and yeah. Anne. It was amazing to have you here and have this discussion. Thank you for having me here.